I'm starting with chapter six. I'm going to read the first half, which is pages 108 to 114. And chapter six is called Hunted. The steady flow of people entering the Northern High School gymnasium had slowed to a trickle as the three o'clock start time for graduation arrived. The wooden bleachers that circled the floor were full of family, friends, and supporters of the crop of graduates who had yet to enter the room. Within an hour, they would watch the high school experience of their children, grandchildren, siblings, nieces, and nephews come to an end. Many in the audience had thought that they would never come, but all were happy it did. The state of Maryland had one of the highest graduation rates in the nation. 76% of high school students who began high school in Maryland completed. In Baltimore County, the number was as high as 85% in some years. But in Baltimore City, where Northern High School was located, it was a dismal 38%. For many in the audience, this was the first high school graduation they had ever attended. The procession of black robes entering the room was replaced by a wave of forest green robes. The students trailed shortly after the faculty. Smiles, waves, cheers, and whistles rang out. Cameras, camera flashes blinked over the parade, parents and friends shooting as wildly as paparazzi. Because his last name put him toward the front of the class, Woody was one of the first to enter the gym, walking with a confident strut. He saw his parents, sister, and grandmother and smiled. He grabbed the edge of his green cap between his thumb and index finger and tipped it to them a sign of respect and gratitude. Woody was one of the students who made it across the finish line, kicking and screaming. He needed two points in the last few weeks to pass English. Jim was his favorite class. Every other class tied for last place. But as he entered the area where all the students were sitting to prepare for the ceremony, he knew none of that mattered. All that mattered was that he was here. He had accomplished his mission of completing high school. The principal valedictorian guest speaker and the rest of the graduation speakers gave their speeches as Woody fought to stay awake. Finally, finally, the moment he was waiting for arrived. The principal asked the class to rise, and one by one, they walked across the stage to receive their diplomas. If the entire class that had started the ninth grade here had finished, it would have been a very long ceremony. ceremony. But only 87 seats were filled that spring morning. This wouldn't take nearly as long as it should have. When it was Woody's turn... He practically danced up to the principal. The crowd laughed as Woody shook the principal's hand and looked up at his family, throwing his arms in the air in a triumphant stance. He carefully jogged down the steps at the end of the stage. As he turned the corner and looked at the dozens of folded, folding chairs where the graduates were sitting, his mind wandered to the people who weren't there. He thought about Damon, a ninth grade classmate who didn't make it to the end of the year. Day took a month off from school to care for his mother who was sick with sickle cell. That month turned to two, and finally, they stopped being a student. Woody thought about White Boy, his boy from the neighborhood, who picked up a job working at a restaurant called Poor Folks. He was tired of school and decided joining the workforce was a better option. Most of all, Woody thought about Wes, who had stopped going to school two years earlier. Wes returned to Dundee Village six months after being locked up for the incident in which he shot at Ray. Wes caught two breaks that night. The first was that the bully, bullet entered Ray's shoulder and went straight through. No major organs were hit, and Ray left the hospital a day later. So Wes was charged with attempted murder rather than murder. The second break was that Wes's case was sent to juvenile court instead of adult court. His attorney argued he should be tried as a juvenile because he would not be a potential threat to the community. Wes went back to school immediately after leaving the juvenile detention facility, the Baltimore County Detention Center in Towson. He enrolled at Lake Clifton High School in East Baltimore, but knew pretty quickly that he would not last long. He was two years older than the other kids in his grade from repeating a grade and losing time locked up. Teachers already dealing with overcrowded classrooms didn't have the time to teach Wes the basics he'd miss. Wes's attendance became sporadic, and once his first child was born, he just stopped going. Not surprisingly, without a high school diploma or job training, and with a criminal record, Wes found it almost impossible to find a job to support his growing family. Alicia was living with the baby in her mother's house while Wes stayed with his aunt Nisi. Nisi was strict and made it clear from the day Wes moved in who was in charge. You need to either get a job or go to school, one of the two, but neither is an option. Neither is not an option. Wes found another option. He decided to make himself scarce. In the mornings while Nisi was at work, Wes would play video games in the house and then head out to check on his drug operation. 
When she was home in the evenings or the early morning, Wes would normally be out trying to find a job, as he would tell her. This charade went on for months. Wes didn't live there so much as he used Nisi's home as a place to rest and increasingly a place to hide his drugs. Wes had his entire operation organized with the preci precision of a military unit or a division of a Fortune 500 company. The drug game had its own rules, its own structure. He was a lieutenant, the leader of his small crew. Everyone in the crew had a specific job with carefully delineated responsibilities. On the lowest rung of the ladder, and in most cases the youngest kids on the team, were the corner boys. These were the kids, sometimes as young as seven, but normally no older than 11, who served as the lookouts for cops. They would huddle on the corners, and when they saw a cop or anyone who looked like a cop, they would yell, Hey Tina, or Hey Susan, or whatever name the crew had designated for the week. That way, they could alert the crew that cops were creeping, but if the cops questioned them, they could simply say they were calling for a friend and walking away unscathed. The hitters were the ones who dealt with the money. This job was very important for obvious reasons, and you need to trust your hitter. This was also one of the most dangerous jobs because if the money ever came up short, the hitter was the one whose neck was on the line. The housemen were in charge of distribution. The drugs were usually cooked and cut in the house, and the housemen would have to make sure the sellers had their supply for the day. The housemen also resupplied the ground soldiers if they sold their allotted amount, allocated amount. Last, you had the muscle, who were there to protect the crew and the lieutenant. They were usually carrying weapons of various kinds and were not afraid to use them. A crew's relevancy, their ability to hold their own corner and expand the business, was dependent on the amount of muscle they controlled and the level of violence their muscle was ready to get into. Sometimes entire crews were muscle. This was the crew. They would work together, fight together, stay together. An unbreakable bond united the crew. For many members, it was the only support system they had. It was family. West managed his team extremely well. At their peak, his team brought in over $4,000 a day. He wasn't one of the main players by any stretch, but he was not doing badly in relation to others in the neighborhood. There were over 100,000 known addicts in Baltimore, and the real number was arguably higher. Given that the city had a population of just under 700,000, there was an obvious glut of addicts. With a demand like that and an ample supply, it was hard not to make money. Still, Wes would find himself wondering about the percentage of that money that found its way into his pocket. He and his team were taking all the risks. They were the ones who faced the arrest and the danger. His bosses, the connects, and the ones bringing the drugs into Baltimore were making the real money. They never had to show their faces on the hard corners where the supply looked the demand in the eye. It started to become clear to Wes. The drug game was raw capitalism and overdrive on overdrive with bullets, a pyramid scheme whose base was dead bodies and ruined lives. Wes stood on the corner in Dundee Village. He no longer lived there, but he had a little operation there. He would bring drugs into the county because he could sell them for a higher premium than in the city. He was surrounded by some guys from his crew. His day was ending. It was 3 o'clock p.m., and he planned to pick up a girl from around the way to go to the movies. He had to get moving, but he lingered. He liked the feeling of holding down a corner with his boys. It was the one place he felt safe, or at least in his element. Wes's green jumpsuit hung over a glossy green t-shirt. His Gianna Brunelli shoes matched his outfit. Wes stayed fresh. He was saying his final goodbyes when a man saddled, sidled up to him. He was clean-shaven, wearing jeans and an oversized t-shirt. Wes had never seen this cat before. Do you, know what, do you guys know where I could buy some rocks? The man asked, his voice conspiratorially gruff. There are a few major tip-offs that tell dealers something isn't right. If a person looks unfamiliar or really out of place, it's probably a cop. If a person you saw arrested a few minutes ago is suddenly back on the street and trying to buy from you, He's probably doing it for a cop. If a person is usually a dime bag customer and is now trying to buy a brick, he's probably working for the cops. If someone's lingo is wrong, if he comes up to you saying, do you guys know where I can buy some rocks? There's a good chance he's a cop. Nope, Russ replied, eyeing the man up and down. The man began to walk away with his head swiveling, seemingly searching for someone else to get drugs from. Wes moved in the opposite direction toward the girl's house. But for some reason, he couldn't let the sale go. He paused, taking a second to look at the man. Taking a second look at the man, Wes thought about the small change he was turning down. The man threw a red flag, but Wes had dealt to people like that before and gotten away with it. He saw the man approach another corner boy and then walk away. Wes got antsy. The movie was starting soon, 
And if he was going to change his mind and make the sale, he better do it fast. He couldn't stop thinking about the money he could make off that sale. Almost exactly enough to take care of his date. The logic felt right. Wes looked to his right, saw a public phone booth, and began to move in that direction. As he approached the booth, he reached into his pocket and pulled out two dime bags of crack cocaine, $20 worth. He placed the small, clear zipper block, zipper lock bags in the phone's metal cover coin return bucket. He quickly scanned his surroundings, checking to see if anyone had seen his drop. When he felt sure that he'd been undetected, he moved toward the potential buyer. It was a risk, and Wes knew it. But taking risks is at the heart of the drug enterprise, and scare money didn't make money. Hey, come here real quick, Wes yelled to the man still wandering aimlessly around the block. The man's head snapped up quickly. Wes looked him up and down again, desperate to recognize him and put his mind at ease. He couldn't. The man moved closer. Wes grabbed his right shoulder and pulled him in close. I don't know who it was that told me, but if you give me $20, you can go over to that phone booth and they said you would be taken care of. The man nodded as his eyes met Wes's. As Wes took the money, their hands touched briefly. The man's hands were smooth and his nails were clean. Dang. It was time to get moving. Wes started walking, never looking back. He placed the $20 bill in his pants pocket and picked up the pace to the girl's house. He popped a breath mint in, breath mint in his mouth. As he turned the corner, he heard a yell behind him. Stop moving and get your hands up. Wes kept walking. He looked forward, hoping they weren't speaking to him, hoping they'd just disappear. He maintained the same pace until he caught sight of two men running toward him. Guns in hand and silver badges swinging from metal chains around their necks, the men pointed their weapons at Wes and ordered him to the ground. Wes saw another man wearing a woodland camouflage shirt crawling from beneath the bushes, reaching in his waist and pulling out a weapon. In total, 10 police officers moved toward Wes. He got down on his knees and laced his fingers behind his head. What did I do, man? I didn't do anything wrong. Wes pleaded with the cop who was reaching over to cuff him while the rest kept their weapons on him. Getting arrested was starting to feel routine. Wes wasn't shocked or afraid anymore, just annoyed. Why him? Why now? Why couldn't they just leave him alone? He had enough to worry about. Wes continued to plead his case as the police read him his rights.